Hello everyone, this is Nairi from Low Carbon Fasting. Now this episode is part of the series on my channel called Type 1 Diabetics Talk, where both hosts and guests or guests are Type 1 Diabetics and you guessed it, we discuss Type 1 Diabetes and uh, related topics. Um, I'll put the playlist um, link below. Please check out all the previous episodes and let me know what you think of them. And if you do like them, don't forget to subscribe. Um, okay, so who's today's guest? Today's guest um, has a degree in biological medicine from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's worked as a nutrition counselor at the uh, Waters Center for Biological Medicine. He's a former endurance athlete. Um, he's currently a diabetes coach and educator at Diverge Diabetes, an organization that whose mission is to spread the message of normal blood sugars for type 1 diabetics um, through um, a low carbohydrate dietary approach. Um, and he's passionate about optimal health and nutrition. Corey Cedar, welcome to Low Carbon Fasting. Hi, thank you for having me. Appreciate the opportunity. Corey, did I uh, leave anything out? Um, anything else? Um, you made me sound smarter than I am. Um, so I'm a biology and psychology graduate at the okay. UW, and um, the rest of it's just like me kind of trying to find my way in the world. So um, tried to do a little research for the UW. Then I moved out west for a while and ended up changing careers and got into coaching just out of personal passion for endurance athletics and uh, hobby mainly. And that's when I was diagnosed with type one diabetes in 2012. And that was pretty hard um, trying to like lead coaching workouts out in the out in the middle of nowhere, newly diagnosed. So that ended up ending lucked into a nutritional counselor with a functional medicine MD. And that's not a path that most people get, but that was a really unique opportunity where it kind of opened me up to um, a whole different uh, perspective on health and, and medicine. And um, the thing you left out was uh, then uh, the, probably the project I was most proud of with uh, my wife and I uh, opened what I think might've been the, the country's first low carb exclusive restaurant um, for, for a while. Um, so when we met, she uh, adopted our way of eating, you know, kind of as a family, and she um, reversed her uh, pre-diabetes, which she didn't know she had. Um, and so then, when she took her food cart business, which is what she had been doing as a as a career and entrepreneur for seven years prior, she um, kind of par um, just kind of pivoted that into uh, a low carb keto options, and we found fantastic ways to make like the food accessible. And that worked up until COVID. And mm -hmm. uh, now I guess maybe that's not the most proud. Now I'm a little more proud of uh, I've been a stay at home parent while I've been coaching uh, a, a little bit, just uh, kind of counseling the study group for Dr. Bernstein's book, helping people understand that. But the real challenge and uh, full time role in my life has been as a stay at home parent with uh, two twin two year olds and a four year old boy who just started 4K. And the two-year-olds are napping, and this is my opportunity to kind of hang out and chat. Which one is more challenging, managing your type one or uh, managing the uh, kiddos? <laughs> you know, if I did it any other way, I'd say type one can really take over a lot of your life. But uh, I, I have it pretty well dialed, and, you know, like I get to push the envelope a little bit and kind of take on more than I have to. Like I just got back from a big workout, and, you know, like that's always a challenge with blood sugar, but I wanted to do that. and. Um, Really, my focus has been on the the child care because wow, did I underestimate that role? Um, that I actually not even underestimate, but it's you know just it, it is uh, parenting twins. Anybody who has done that, like I've I've walked past twins and said, oh, they're so cute, and not really comprehended. And it's a lot of work. Anyone who has triplets just like straight up has my condolences and like uh, you know offer anybody you know with with triplets a, a hand because I don't know how you could do it without help. I I can only imagine I've uh, parented only one. 
She's it's hard a, enough. She's an adult now, and that wasn't easy. <laughs> yeah. So that wasn't easy. I can imagine what it will feel like to have three and twins. Okay. So, um, Corey, you uh, mentioned, uh, you briefly referred to your diagnosis sort of story. Let's go, get back to it. So how old were you at the time? You were an endurance athlete and otherwise a presumed yeah, good... Yeah, that's an important good, topic. Good. And I feel like a lot of my uh, experiences have been like, kind of just like yelling at me to to point out to the world that things aren't as they should be because Madison's a quite educated town and we have a good medical system and every every year a new hospital goes up and you know like it's not for lack of medicine but I, I had just finished I think at the time Ironman Wisconsin it was my fourth Ironman and I had done a bunch of endurance athletic stuff at that point and you know, like I noticed during the like months preceding, I got this weird stitch in my like center of my abdomen. I don't know what that was, if it was pancreatitis or something just related to my blood sugar being out. Went to the doctor a couple of times for like eye infections because I was swimming in open water and people, you know, like measured my height and weight and blood pressure, but nobody ever tested my blood sugar. And then I did a, a, challenge ride where you ride like 24 hours through the night with a team on indoor bike trainers and I ended up getting like nausea to the point of vomiting and I assumed like as an athlete oh I just need some orange juice or something like that and I got you know like I was just not feeling well and I, I ended up bailing on that which is not of my character and then the next days later luckily I I believe I threw up that orange juice, which probably helped me, you know, anyone who understands diabetes. Now I know that that was the wrong approach, but I, I went into coach the next morning or two mornings later. And I was like adjusting the screen because the projector was blurry to me and everyone was like, Oh, it's fine. It's fine. And I've always prided myself on having like 2010 vision. And I'm like, no, something's wrong. And one of the riders, uh, one of the athletes in the class who had a partner with type 1 diabetes noticed that, that I made like six trips to the bathroom drinking my coffee that, you know, during a one hour training class. And she, you know, reached out to me afterwards, handed me her partner's glucometer the next day and probably saved my life and, and tipped me off. And I went into my doctor and, and they tested my blood sugar at 360 or something like that. Handed me a diet seven up, some metformin and some gliberide or one of those insulin sensitizers and set an appointment for three weeks later and misdiagnosed me as type two. And I know that that didn't seem right because I, I was like, I mean, I was a competitive, I'm not like a professional athlete, but I wasn't like, it, it didn't make sense to me. I was, I look like I do now. I had a, you know, the waist to hip ratio. Like I, I was, I'm six, five. I was 215 pounds at that time. Um, it, it just didn't make sense. And so like, I had to fight the system right from the beginning to get them to give me insulin. Like I remember I had to go into urgent care um during a Packer game because that's when urgent care I'm like nobody's gonna be there and I broke down in tears to the doctor I was like give me insulin I need I don't want my blood sugar at 360 I know this is bad and they're like well you have an appointment in two weeks for training and I'm like are you kidding me give me insulin like it was it was really an ugly introduction and I've kind of had that held that uh, chip on my shoulder ever since as kind of fair warning that um you really got to fight to get proper treatment because I've since figured out that not only was I misdiagnosed but my mother who has been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes since 2000 so 12 years prior to that she too has been misdiagnosed and it took her 20 years to get her doctors to officially change hers she just was luckily on insulin but like yeah when you get into the diabetes community you see a high fraction of the people with LADA the you know adult version of diabetes you know, misdiagnosed and just left to languish because, you know, especially if you do have, you know, belly fat, they're just like, oh yeah, we're not going to test your, your antibodies or anything like that. Like they just throw you in with the masses of type twos. Corey, and, we uh, are going, uh, I'd like to talk more in detail about the misdiagnosis yeah. before that. How old were you at the time? I was and 33. 30, 33. Um, and how 
much did you know about type 1 diabetes? I mean, uh, did you suspect that you may be um, type 1? I, so, I, I mean, I studied biology at a good university and I, I, I had intended to go to med school. So I studied physiology in uh, like two or three different college level classes. And like they introduce it and you're kind of still left scratching your head at which one's one and which one's two, because why do they name something by a number? But, um, you know, like I, I knew something was off, but I, I immediately just started reading books and researching because um, 2012 was a good, you know, like you, you have the Internet, you can you can mm -hmm. read. And I, I, of course, found a bunch of like veganish stuff to kind of put me on the path. And um, that wasn't the right path. But I just kept reading, kept reading, kept reading until like I, I could start to make sense of things. Um, but yeah, um, I do have a nephew who was diagnosed in his teens with type one. So I like I understood that he needed insulin to, you know, eat at meal times, And I didn't understand the goals of control. But like all the stuff that was about diabetes that I was reading, you know, was about, you know, minimizing postprandial spikes. And, you know, here I am like trying to be a you know, really elite athlete at that point so that I could, you know, attract clients as a coach. And I'm like, I want to continue to perform. How am I going to do this? Because I'm going to hit the ground running with like essentially putting my foot on the gas on this roller coaster. So I was just trying to figure out ways to simplify it. And, um, you know, I just fortunately just kept looking until I found good, good resources. Coming back to the misdiagnosis, I mean, it's a very very common story yeah. how can we put a stop to it i mean what would it take for a doctor to actually correctly diagnose to run the antibody test for example it's yeah. not going to cost we're not talking about some uh very rare sort of testing in very rare or um you know lab conditions it's a fairly common test yeah, yeah. i don't they run the antibody test to act well, to, to be able to properly diagnose diabetics? Yeah, I'm I mean, it would be the, the time that they have, but also not even just for the adult diabetics. I mean, there's there's type one children that are often left and sent home frequently, uh, just saying, oh, it's the flu, oh, it's some sort of gastro bug, and they're left to you know kind of you know potentially die too. So I think that just the greater awareness of blood sugar in general. I think there's this movement to just test one drop, you know, like, why was my blood pressure measured in, in my like 30s? Why have they been measuring my blood pressure since I've been like a teenager, but they don't measure blood sugar in a diabetes epidemic. So I think that just needs to change as to become like, it costs seven to 17 cents for a test strip with insurance. So I'm sure they can get them at wholesale. You know, like just test your blood sugar there in, in a clinic and, and tell you, even if it's a spot check, like, oh, you're not feeling well, let's see what it is. And maybe that confuses some issues here and there where it's like, oh, blood sugar does go up during illnesses. But, you know, if you catch something overt, like you, you, you it's lack of time, lack of curiosity, honestly, uh, that's my opinion. But, um, you know, you'd have to ask somebody who works specifically in that field why their eyes aren't on it uh diagnosis now like it, i don't remember a type 1 diabetic being in my school and now i think the rates among children are are greater than one in a thousand depending on mm -hmm. on what data you're looking at or which location but you know like that's not super rare it's not super common mm -hmm. But like you see these rates increasing and something's driving it. I can theorize only, but something environmental because genetics don't change that fast. Um, and so like we should just have greater awareness. Um, I have a theory about why adults are not <clears throat> being, uh, you know, properly tested, you know, being that the greatest care organization for raising awareness is named after juveniles but um, they should be the Diabetes Research Foundation in my um, disgruntled opinion, rather than trying to raise money, you know, which is probably easier when you have the word juvenile coming first. But uh, yeah, I'm a little upset about that because I think when you really look into, like there's a few people who've written fantastic blogs on the, the topic of adult misdiagnosis 
And when you further look into it, I think Joe Kraft in his book kind of shows the rates being pretty high in the elderly. Like the older you get, the more likely you are to be misdiagnosed. But it's like the average age of onset of diabetes is probably closer to 30. Mm. Uh, and, you know, like that sounds crazy to somebody who thinks of it specifically as a juvenile disease. And that's part of the problem. I mean, uh, the saddest thing in all this, the saddest sort of story is, you know, the uh, deaths as a result of DKA um, among all diabetics, but particularly yeah. teenagers, right? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, in the last six months, I heard of three cases, three teenagers died of DKA because they were not diagnosed and these aren't diagnosed diabetics because at least with the diagnosis comes at least some awareness of DKA. I think that's one of the first lectures that uh, 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 endos give people um, a diagnosis yeah. but um, and hence hence the fear of ketones but we'll come to that in a minute. Yeah, yeah, but, the, uh, yeah. but, uh, but not checking blood sugars, not you know, not making people aware of the importance of blood sugars and probably the symptoms of DKA. Um, both of these parents, I heard their stories. In fact, I spoke to one parent. They took their, their son, 16-year-old, um, to, to an emergency, and it was just too late. Um, they couldn't tell, couldn't tell, couldn't recognize the symptoms of DKA. Um they put it down to hormones. Oh, he's having, uh, you know, his teenage thing. He just wants to be alone. He just wants to go to sleep early or he doesn't want to wake up. Um, so I'm really passionate about, you know, raising and spreading awareness of the symptoms of DKA and the importance of checking blood sugars for everyone. Everyone at home should have a glucometer. There's just yeah. no excuse these days. Yeah. I mean, I, I do have like... There's the the frog in the pot analogy because like my symptoms when I was diagnosed in 2012 my A1C uh, tested ab above 11 percent, which is uh, like triple quadruple normal, and if I kind of then in retrospect talk think about the symptoms that I was experiencing with like dry cracked lips frequent urination, all those things make sense post analysis. But I, it was so easy to discount it as a person experiencing it. Like it's it's easy to not recognize it. And, and depending on the rate of onset there, like, you know, like you're thirsty, so you drink more. So you pee more. And, you know, like diagnoses are often in winter. I think that might relate to like seasonality with vitamin D levels. But I just got a humidifier in my room and was like thinking I was, oh, the dry air is causing my lips to be cracked, not the fact that I'm you know, experiencing, you know, like just the high levels of blood sugar that are dehydrating me entirely. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an awareness issue in general. And I think hopefully like the upside of just greater awareness of diabetes overall, whether type one or type two is just an understanding of the effects. Um, but yeah, like frequent in infections, urinary tract stuff for women or even like issues with, with that. I was waking up with numb arms for yeah. months. It was weird. And I, like, I just thought I was sleeping wrong. Like, how do you discount something severe enough like that? Or that side stitch that I you know experienced probably in August before, you know, like and it prevented me from being able to run comfortably, but I didn't go to a doctor for it because I just was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm a healthy guy. So like if I present like that and I go into a doctor and I'm just like, oh, I'm fine. I just need, you know, something's up. Like they're not going to immediately think diabetes. But, you know, in retrospect, with such serious you know consequences, I think it's just like we need to include blood sugar testing in general in every doctor's visit. Um, we need more doctors just to wear blood sugar monitors, like get a Dexcom on anybody and you're gonna get some some different responses to what they're prescribing as far as healthy diet advice. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, just, I think once measurement becomes more frequent and like people aren't so afraid of needles and poking their finger, you know, like that stuff never bothered me, but like 
you know, Theranos was founded on that whole fear of people, you know, not wanting to get their fingers pricked. So, um, you know, like needle phobia is a big part of it. People don't want blood drawn at a doctor's office, you know, like don't poke my kid's finger, but you know, my kid sees me poke my finger all the time and he lines up and says, test my blood sugar, daddy, you know, like, <laughs> Say mom used to do to that. Normalized. Mom used to do that when she was little. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about your role in Diverge. Now you are now running um but uh bursting classes, if I may call them yeah. so. So and I have to say, um Bernstein does need clarifying. <laughs> yeah. and and simplifying right mm -hmm. you can't just tell a uh uh you know all type ones to read bernstein and they'll be on top of it he's uh i use his book as a reference i have it by my bedside so every now and again i open a chapter and go oh okay well that's kind of new to me how come i haven't read that before so <laughs> it's yeah. like every time i hold a book in my hand I discover something new. Well, not necessarily new, but a different sort of angle or a different sort of explanation. So what you're doing is uh, commendable. I mean, I have, uh, I, I really do want to join. So once my schedule is uh, <laughs> to join those classes, once I've, uh, my schedule is a little bit calmer, I'm um, going to ask Lisa if I may join those classes. I really would like to learn more myself. Now, for anyone who hasn't heard of Bernstein, who is Dr. Bernstein, and what does he uh, what does he teach? Well, he's he's a little old man who's been fighting against the system for a very long time. Um, you know, I almost feel like I, I discounted him when I first came across him because I, I I found low carb before I found Dr. Bernstein, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh yeah, just one more person who lines up with what I'm trying to put together. And then it wasn't until like a, probably about a over six months or maybe even almost a year in before I actually purchased his book because I, I you can find so much online and I was listening to his monthly teleseminars and you know like I spent all my money on other books already or you know like um, but you know Dr. Bernstein is a a man who's what is he eighty seven now he's somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. uh, diagnosed young, I believe 13. There's, there's actually the, the, the intro of the book. I had to summarize it, but that was, that was when we started this project. Uh, he was diagnosed young and he struggled with his blood sugar and he was, uh, you know, went into a career of, uh, engineering. He wanted to be like a physicist or something along that lines, um, married to a doctor. And I believe he ordered like this, this uh, glucometer, one of the first available glucometers through like a lab supply book that his wife had. And she, since she was a doctor, he was able to order it. And because he was an engineer, he wired it to a battery as opposed to a, an inline source. And so he put it in his backpack and started testing his blood sugar and using an engineer's logic to normalize his blood sugar. And so that was somewhere in his mid or late thirties. And then he tried to get his, his techniques published and got a lot of backlash, even though like his doctor was like some of the preeminent doctors at the ADA. And so if you can't beat him, join him. He's he kind of of that mindset. So he went back to uh, get his MD and even with an MD, he still <laughs> didn't catch on because there's a lot of uh, resistance to the concept. Oh, people won't test their blood sugars this long. Like, you read the history of diabetes, it was like, why would people want to come to see their doctor if they could test blood sugar at home? You know, like doctors were very insecure about that honest threat. Um, and now it's about A1Cs, which you can also test at home. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like it was kind of that level of just inertia of uh, not wanting to change. And then like right when the diet heart hypothesis was probably kicking in where people were starting to think that the complications of diabetes were more related to the fats than to the, you know, the lack of normalization of blood sugar. And he's, you know, just observed in himself that once he normalized his blood sugar by removing the fast acting carbohydrates from his diet and focusing on protein primarily, he noticed like his 
life-threatening um digestive issues with like his he he had uh like fairly advanced kidney disease at that point and he had young kids at that age and he, you know like after being a doctor I, I believe either before or after being a doctor but he, he was reading and he's like okay my life expectancy is like three or four years from this point of of kidney disease and you know like now it's 2023 and he's still looking healthy you know like he has some um consequences like i think he blames his droopy eyelid one droopy eyelid and like his short stature as a diabetes complication but otherwise like he is sharp as a tack he's you know continued to to work and exercise and you know have this uh practice where he's just kind of trying to get the message out and I feel like it was fortunate, like when I joined uh, up with like some of the admins in when type one grit was formed, that's right when everything like I, I, I found a lot of my information through podcasts. So I think it's a really good uh, medium for, you know, just kind of people sharing the wisdom of crowds and ra rather than just kind of top down information. Um, but, you know, it was right there where he was able to kind of, you know, catch a, 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 a social movement almost when like this, this second or maybe third reemergence of low carb and you know like just starting to to get his information out there now and i feel like he's being uh popularized much more he's kind of been in the shadows up until maybe 2000s depending on when you found him but like i found him in 2012 and you know like his book is dense it's a 450 page manual uh, of really specific stuff addressing all the the, the myths that you have to overcome and all the tools that you need to learn that are outside of the normal standard of care. And it's a lot to take in, like, especially as somebody who is just diagnosed with diabetes, their doctor is telling them something else from this. And then they're trying to adapt potentially a lifestyle that is probably like, I was a very high carb consumer. Also, my first inclination was to cut way back, but you know, that's not what everybody's told. So, you know, like if you don't want to do it and your doctor says it's dangerous, you know, it's not going to catch on. And so like, it doesn't have a lot of support and it's hard to figure out. Like I have a degree in science and it, it, you know, like it took me reading the book. I think this is fifth or sixth time that I've read the book and, you know, since in 11 years, like I just kind of make a habit of trying to go through it. I have it on audible. I have it on my Kindle. I have two copies um, we had copies at our cafe that we would just give out, you know, like, and there, everything that I, I, like I had it highlighted to, to almost margin to margin. So, um, it would be nice if there was more support. And so that, that's what Lisa and, and our goal was with Diverge is to make a cliff notes version of it as much as possible. <laughs> that was our, our onset. And then you end up with 60 slides per chapter and it's like, okay, it's, it's more like rather than Cliff's notes, it's like the um, teacher's edition of a te textbook mm -hmm. is what we kind of put together and highlight the main points. And so we can discuss and use other people's opinion during a, a monthly session to go over a chapter and help people understand what they don't understand. Um, there's confusion with international crowds between units. There's you know, unit conversions and uh, available insulins and what foods are called in different places. Like there's all kinds of uh, topics to discuss. So like there's no shortage to, uh, of things that we kind of need to, to work through in the book, but like we're, we're going to try to to simplify it a little bit coming up and, and keep the pace a little faster because I mean, you need to get back through that whole thing in like three months in order to kind of make some changes in your life to try to get going with a diabetes diagnosis and you know not everybody's able to to dedicate that amount of time because they're too busy juggling diabetes or you know just every other issue in the or excuse in the world kind of pops up uh what makes uh bernstein really comprehensive i think is the fact that, well, A, he doesn't just talk about type 1 diabetes alone, but all diabetes, including yeah. type 2, when the different, although he leaves some of the uh, subcategories out, but he just covers blood sugars and diabetes in general. Um, and also, it's probably the only book out there that covers the diabetes or high blood sugar related complications in such detail yeah. that 
honestly, I mean, you would, you would, you would be a fool not to read it. You have to read it. If you are type one or type two out there um, and you haven't read Bernstein, I recommend that you read it because that's the only place you're going to understand all the different complications that come along with high blood sugars. I haven't I haven't read about those complications anywhere else. I mean, Bernstein covers them in such detail. It's it's extraordinary. I mean, I've read so many type one diabetes books. They either refer to those complications uh, very briefly and move on, or they just mention a few of the uh, most prominent ones, of course, like retinopathy, neuropathy, and maybe one or two others, and that's it. Uh, and kidney disease, maybe heart, heart, heart disease, cardiovascular health as well, which is closely relate, related to blood sugars. So uh, yes, it's a comprehensive book. Um, contact Diverse Diabetes, I'll put their link below and see if you can actually join those classes run by um, Corey. Okay, um, so Corey, um, Bernstein mentions low carbohydrate diet. He removes grains and he removes most fruits. He even removes some vegetables like tomatoes. Well, tomatoes for you, tomatoes for me. So, um, <laughs> so um, but, uh, but he doesn't really mention how much protein one should have and he doesn't talk that much about fat i mean not in a prescriptive yeah. way he doesn't say this is how much fat you yeah. should have maybe for a good reason because of course this can be used as leverage by various and depending on context and depending on age your current health status physical activity etc because i know i played with those two um all the time i mean i shift them i hide the fat i lower the fat i want to lose i want to put on weight i want to lose weight i play with the fat and that makes a huge impact on me, whether I'm doing resistance training or I'm taking a break from it, I up and the protein. So I play with those two. So what does Bernstein say really about uh, all the three macronutrients? Well, what do you do? <laughs> yeah, I love one. I, I wish I would have known this question was coming because one of my favorite Bernstein clips is of him saying that uh, when asked about a ketogenic diet, He's actually not in favor and he doesn't consider his low carb diet a ketogenic diet because of the protein focus. Um, I, I always say that I'm a protein focused, uh, very low carb consumer. Mm -hmm. And he does give some guidelines in general with regard to body mass. And he talks about how growing children and athletes may uh, require more, um, but he doesn't give like a calorie balance formula or anything like that. Um, it's very much a, um, a trial and adjustment procedure that he provides. But uh, like he does does reference something like 1.8 grams per, you know, per kilogram of lean body mass of ideal uh, lean body mass mm -hmm. uh, as, as a reference point, as a which is a high protein uh, diet. And yes. he includes the chapter on on kind of the myths of the harms of protein at the end. I think it should be moved further up into, in, into the beginning of the book because that's the concern. My concern with protein initially was just the price of protein. Um, but um, one of, so that clip he describes as far as ketogenic diets, because he's he's in his teleseminars and those monthly ones when I was listening, he would specifically say that it's not a, a, not a, a ketogenic diet and it's not because of the insulin required for protein will keep you out of that ketosis. I'm only mildly ketotic, you know, like even the Verda data, you see people like the, you, you elevate your ketones when you're not adapted to them. And then they kind of settle back in once you're metabolically flexible. So um, the focus needs to be on blood sugar and not on chasing ketones. He doesn't, you know, like that would be controversial in its own way. And he's controversial enough, but then he comments like, the ketogenic diet that I worry most about is the ADA food pyramid diet, because that's the one that causes, you know, diabetic ketoacidosis. And he throws it right back in their face. And I I, I love that clip. And it's somewhere in the Diabetes University's videos, uh, clips on YouTube. But, uh, you know, he's being honest there. Like, you know, when you're adapted to ketones, they're not dangerous. And when you're, you know, in control of your blood sugar, like that's the last concern I have, unless I have like a dehydrating illness, which 
he has a whole chapter dedicated to because that's the real issue is when you're not getting insulin or your insulin pump fails and that's why he's not a fan of insulin pumps he's a very uh, low tech, keep it simple, stupid perspective on how to manage. And um, yeah, I just think that he, you know, just constantly has his eyes on blood sugar because that's the goal. Um, he says, don't even really bother with, with ketones and me being kind of curious, of course I've measured anyway. And I think most people, people do. Um, but I, I had curiosity, like initially, like, what am I doing with the, the exercise? What are the effects of exercise during that? Mm -hmm. Or if I, miss a meal how long and what level do they go to and you know like so i do have experience knowing that oh yeah i i even by the end of an iron man my ketones aren't at a level even if i didn't eat any carbs or anything at all that day my ketones stay below a dangerous range mm -hmm. so you know like it's just um eyes on protein at all times for bernstein Yes. Or eyes on blood sugar, sorry. Uh, but eyes on blood sugars, but also the yeah. focus on protein, yeah. which is and the fat he says consume the fat that comes along with the food naturally. Right. Don't add fat. Um to that I, I add the caveat, sorry to talk over you again. Um I, I really like how his uh diet description lines up quite uh in line with what is put together with keto gains, which is kind of a bodybuilding uh mm -hmm. group, which is very protein focused, very low carb. Um, and these are people, you know, not diabetic, but there are several of us type ones in that, in that group, but following that same logic, they, they think of protein as a goal, uh, carbs as a limit and fat as a, a lever, meaning it's mm -hmm. like if you have body fat on you to lose, burn that first. But if you, um, kind of, or, or body or fat to satiety is another way to kind of looking at it, which that could be dysregulated in some people. But, um, you know, fat's kind of a variable depending on on your unique metabolism at that point or what you're adapted to. But um, I like those two kind of convergent co concepts there. Which is what uh, I do. My focus is on protein. Um, ca carb is almost a constant because it's always super, super low. Um, and I play, I play with the, with the fat. Occasionally I play with the protein. Um, you know, instead of the 1. 1.8 uh, 1. grams per kilogram of body weight, I may go down to 1.6. Um, but uh, but generally, uh, a protein is also pretty much a constant for me. Now, um, we've got to talk about dosing for protein because that's kind of... <laughs> that's a topic that kind of screams at you out there. And many people struggle with it. I... Um, I read Bernstein's recommendations, but because I don't have our insulin, okay. I had to figure out for myself how to dose for protein um, and how to dose differently for different protein sources using my pump and, um, and obviously rapid acting insulin. So I've got it now. I've cracked it, but it takes a lot of trial and error and, you know, being confident and experimenting. And I do have a CGM as well, so I'm not taking sort of life-threatening <laughs> risks. And I'm fortunate enough that all the work that I do is from home. So I'm in a comfortable environment most of the time where I can actually monitor myself closely and figure out what works for me. What would be a good starting point for someone who's struggling with uh, dosing for protein? I mean, I'll tell people what I do in a minute. However, if you don't have access to our insulin, it seems to be what works for most, not all though. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's a, that's probably the most important question of, is why don't you have access to, to our insulin? Because that would be, I mean, it's funny that there's like, Anytime there's something new, whether it's a tool, like even though it's not new, um, anything different, like there's this fear or reluctance about it because like here you are, your doctor who you trust and, and you know, learn to love is telling you that here's the best insulin on the market, put this in your pump and this is how you'll dose for carbs. But then, you know, like you figure it out, you know, like, oh, I start seeing a high after, you know, two hours after meals. And like the ADA style, like when I was initially trained, it was like, 
oh, just keep protein constant and it's not going to, you know, it'll just blend into your basil is kind of how they're covering it with too high of a basil. So then people go for a walk and tank uh, because their basil is too high or they, you know, like it's, but it's a second order effect of, of a meal independent from the carbs. Um, R is the perfect tool to use it. So I would do whatever you had to do to obtain that, even if it was to have to pay full price through uh, through your doctor's office to do it, because it's just the safest way to approach it. Um, you can mimic it with square boluses, and you could probably you know work you know find ways to do it with your. I haven't started doing the the closed loop myself, but you could you can adjust it in there. Um, you know, most people probably do eat a consistent level of protein meal to meal. But once they remove the fast acting or even reduce the, the carbohydrate in general in their diet, the the fraction of their meal that becomes protein will make that delayed second order effect that is normally obscured, especially when you have chaotic blood sugar from the carbs. Uh, it'll make it the primary feature of your blood sugar trace when you when you eat a meal. And the way that Bernstein does it, as I mentioned before, is trial and adjustment. Like, um, mm-hmm. you know, for, for me, I, you know, I'm in Wisconsin, so I joke, like, find something pre-portioned, you know, like, you need to, to, to have a control of the idea of portions. Each type of protein is slightly different as far as its timing um, or, or amount. But there's, you know, Bernstein does mention something like two ounces of protein food is covered by one unit of R. And for me, that's that's way too much. For me, it's closer to I, I eat about four and a half uh, ounces of protein food, which is covered by one unit of R. And for me, that's taken um, at the time of the meal or at the end of the meal. Um, some proteins are faster for me, like pork is a faster digesting. It's a response to the amino acids kind of hitting your um, small intestines. So um, like different foods just have a slightly different profile or hits like, I think wild game in general hits harder, the higher proteins, but it's start with a fixed measured amount in Wisconsin. I would say a bratwurst and then, you know, cause it's like three ounces per, um, but for me, I'm eating about like, I'm a big guy, I'm 220 pounds and, uh, you know, like 200 of that is lean body mass. And so for me to get in 200 you know, grams of protein in a day, I'm eating meals that are easily over 16 ounces of protein in a a meal. And you'll notice that effect, Um, especially like the challenge would be dinner meals. Bernstein specifically talks quite a bit about not eating your dinner late um, so that you have time. And especially like the the consequence of eating at like eight o'clock and then laying down as opposed to helping your digestion uh, moving around and going for like a, even just a little post meal walk or t- something like that, where you, you're a, much more active during the day. Um, plus the consequences of how frequent gastroparesis really is, especially at night. Um, you want to kind of tease through all those variables, keeping everything as as simple as possible. You know, if you're normally a late protein eater, shift it earlier, or a late dinner eater, shift it earlier while you kind of do these just logic puzzles of, you know, essentially basal testing and then eating fixed meals of like, so you have to eat brats three days in a row. That would be called a really good week in Wisconsin. Um, Or, you know, if you have, you know, burgers that are pre-portioned or chicken breasts that are all the same size, you know, like Mm -hmm. you just make notes, you observe and say, oh, I was a little under on my dose that time. Or, you know, the timing was a little off and I saw the effect that I went high and then low and you adjust accordingly, but you're just playing with these tools um, of logic. And it's just like, it's actually an obtainable puzzle to figure out when you have it down to one effective protein, not being obscured by the chaos of the carbohydrate. True, true. Um, So another common question people ask is about, you know, measuring the protein. So, You see this in the type one grit group as well. People go, are we actually measuring the weight of the protein food or the protein value? (laughs) So let's just clarify that because it's a common misconception. How do we measure the protein in say, I don't know, the chicken breast? Are we actually weighing the chicken breast themselves or looking at, 
it's easy to find online, by the way, and there are yeah. loads of apps out there, but or looking at a protein value in the chicken breast. I don't know that there's a right or a wrong answer as long as you're consistent. Um, it, it really is about dosing for meals, and it's not about a magic formula for numbers. So for me, I do like... I always eat the same number of eggs for breakfast because I know that that's going to be 10 ounces of eggs. And I know that that's four units of insulin for me. And that works out perfectly in the morning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you, but you know, if you think about like a lot of people are really reluctant to give up the freedom and they think that um, being on a more fixed meal plan way of eating, I, it's not a diet cause I'm not hungry um, or I'm not like uncomfortably hungry. Um, but if you think about what the average American is eating, even when you look at the 80,000 products in a grocery store, it's all corn, wheat, and soy. Mm -hmm. um, but really, if you look in their cupboards and people's habits, like you're eating the same meals. Like how many meals are people uniquely preparing in a week? Are they making 10 meals, five meals? Like most people are pouring kibble cereal into their bowls in the morning or oatmeal, you know, and then eating the same sandwich type thing for lunch you know like the variety and satiety of what I do now is far superior to what I was doing before and I look forward to my meals and you know like it's an addictive response and justification to those carbohydrates of I don't want to give up my donut whatever but like I ran a restaurant where we can make all that stuff and like just knowing the freedom of it exists makes me content in knowing that like yeah if I really cared for it I could make a cheesecake if I wanted to um but, but you know like to dose for something you have to have eaten it before and we eat a lot of our foods on repeat and that's that's kind of the key to success if you're then looking at like a rare treat you can somewhat back calculate seven grams of protein on a product by a package and um, say that that's the equivalent to about one ounce of a protein food um, and there's ways to kind of think logically about it. But, you know, again, those are kind of puzzles and you're doing the math to kind of reverse engineer what you know actually works is like, oh, four units for six eggs, you know, is mm -hmm. is my breakfast that, that works or one of my breakfasts that work. Um, but yeah, just as long as you're consistent, whether it's pre or post cooking, you know, like if you're cooking it probably similar ways each time, like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I tend to weigh my food post you know, um, cooking, I think keto gains, the, their advice might be pre, I, I, I think as long as you're looking at it consistently, because that's what matters. Um, I recently interviewed as part of this series, actually, Dr. Um, uh, Keith Runyon, um, oh, good. and <laughs> the nephro type one nephrologist, and his his focus is on consistency. <laughs> he said, if I can keep all the variables in, in my life as consistent as possible, not just the meals that I eat, yeah. um, but also the time of exercise, my wake up time, sleep time. So if I can keep all these variables that clearly have an impact on blood sugars, if I can keep most of them or all of them as constant as possible. That's you know, the battle at least, you know, half won. So, yeah. And uh, I, I try to do that too. I try to do that, except on days I'm fasting because I do fasting. And that's something that most Bernsteiners don't do. However, I have heard that a lot of Bernstein sort of advocates also do the occasional intermittent fasting. So, um, so I don't, I, I see part of the confusion is um, I, discovered Bernstein late like you I mean I started low carb I was diagnosed back in 78 1978 right and um I started low carb in 2015 and I didn't discover I didn't hear about Bernstein until 2020 probably just as COVID was hitting us Okay. And I ordered the diabetes solution and it's been by my bedside side ever since. Um, so, uh, but before Bernstein, I was already trying to figure out how I can do this and how I can manage my blood sugars um, better, how I can stop the fluctuations, the crazy highs and the crazy lows. Um, so 
although I do incorporate, incorporate a lot of Bernstein's teachings into my own management, I can't call myself 100% Bernsteiner, <laughs> if that is a word at I all. I recommend you give it a trial because, uh, yeah, there's kind of been a, a popular blog, I, I believe RD is shared within Type 1 Grit community, but the 100% commitment can be far easier than the decision fatigue of 99% commitment. And then that 1%, maybe I'm going to do something else, maybe not. Uh, will I say yes to this when you just know I don't eat that? Or I, you know, when the answer is just kind of simplified, because we are creatures of habit. Um, mm -hmm. One of the tools that Lisa with uh, has really taught me with Diverge is um, she she introduced me to the book Atomic Habits, uh, James Clear, and in in like the challenges with my parenting and and everything right now, it's you know like these babies thrive on routine and like all the things that need to get done. If you actually are thinking about them and deciding, am I going to do the laundry now? Am I going to wake up at this time? You know, then you're not going to, then you're going to miss things. But if you just get in the habit of like, oh, I'm in the kitchen. This is when I do the, the, you know, put the dishes away. And this is when I wash the bedding. And this is when, you know, meals are prepped. And when you just put yourself on that autopilot, it takes a cognitive load away. And I, I highly recommend that book because I'm probably making it sound uh, unattractive, but like it really has helped my, my, my satisfaction with how I get things done to just, you know, kind of put those on the back burner and just get, get shit done. You know, like it, you just end up being more productive when, when you just are in a pattern and, you know, you know, I see it as making myself happier, but I also see the impact that it has on like, you know, you'd be surprised what a two-year-old learns to anticipate as far as like, oh, what's next? Oh, you know, like go outside. It's like, yeah, of course, this is when we go outside and do this. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of part of our nature. The importance of routine. Um, I can't, I mean, I can't agree with that more because, uh, you know, even as an educator, I've been an educator for 30 years. So <laughs> you need to have those routines and everyone knows where they stand and, you know, whether they're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. But uh, yeah, I, I keep things as consistent as possible. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I love my pump. <laughs> I yeah. wouldn't want to give it up. I love my pump and it works. I make it. I yeah. can't say it works for me just because it's a pump, right? No, I've yeah. made it. I've made it work for me. Yeah. Uh, it, this has the automated because it speaks, it's supposed to speak with uh, Dexco. Okay. I don't put it on the automated <laughs> mode yeah. because I personally, on a manual mode, manage my diabetes much, much better than on the automated mode. And so, uh, you know, there are certain things that I do my own way. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something, that's a message for all type ones, right? Educate yourself. Collect all that information. Understand the process and it frees you up to do things within your own comfortable context. Because yeah, I, I also too have embraced the pump uh, and we get comfortable with these things. Like I, this is the same pump. I'm still on the arrows pump since the same one since 2012 and it's expiring this year. Mm -hmm. uh, like where they're not supporting it. So I will make that leap soon, but I've been very slow because what I have is working and my A1C has always been in the normal range. Uh, this whole time and like I'll change when I have to because right now excuse excuse I'm focusing on kids mm -hmm. but I like to keep my my diabetes as minimal as possible in my life and I'll have to you know crack a few eggs to figure it out to like just you know learn new things but I will you know I will be able to just knowing that you have the freedom to to do things and adapt them but understanding that base underlying physiology, like, are, are, so you're using the Omnipod 5 there or the Dash? It's it's the Omnipod, Omnipod 5 okay. with Dexcom, is it G5, G6, G6. Okay. Yeah, and my mom's on that. Okay. She's however, in an assisted living situation, and I love however, that. I'm exists. kind of regretting moving to this because, uh -huh. uh, you know, my pre um, with the Omnipod 5, the Six lowest target that you can set on on the pdm you have a pdm right with your dash yeah i got the brick yeah 
Right. So so this one has its own PDM too, which is a little bit more fancy looking. But yeah, the lowest yeah. target you could set on that one, my pr previous one, I'd set a blood sugar target for me at five uh, in our measurements. I'll put all the conversions on the screen later. Um, however, on this one, it's 6.1. So that's the lowest target. And so even when I put six. 0.1 in and ask for a correction, uh, 6.9, for example, the lowest it can get, get me down to is 6.1. So I even have to overwrite that myself manually. And so I think, you know, I'm, I'm considering soon going back to my old pump. Yeah. <laughs> I just, just don't like this technology because I think it's targeted, it's aimed at, you know, keeping blood sugars high. They want you to avoid hypos at all costs, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that it exists for my mother because it's far better than what she was doing. She's been struggling with her um, ability to manage on her own. And so now in the setting, eating low carb, she, she keeps her A1C in a low six. And I'm happy... For that, I mean, I would love for it to be better, um, but you know, as an 84 year old, like I'll take good over, you know, like catastrophic risk. Like she can't change the TV if my, you know, kid goes over there and switches the input button or something like that. So she's not a tech person, but that's simple enough for her to to work with with the nursing staff where she's staying. And like in time, that technology, I hope will will continue to, to improve as confidence within and acceptance of a low carb, like low carb should be the first approach taught. I still think that, mm -hmm. and we should still keep fighting for that goal. Um, but yeah, there, there are people like I'm upgrading to dash instead because yeah, I'm not going to settle for a 6.5 when I'm disappointed when my A1C is 5.3. So, you know, like I I'll, I'll either manual mode it myself, but you know, like, that technology will improve. I like the Omnipod's design is allows them to update a little faster like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's, it's one thing I do outside of Bernstein, but I liked the ability to run temp basils for my, for my um, athletic needs so that I could be changing my, my background insulin. Cause I used to go on like six, six hour bike rides and do weird stuff like that. Um, now it's just because it's comfortable and I, I'm familiar with it and, you know, love the one you're with type of concept. But, um, you know, there's many ways to manage this. And as long as as long as you get the the key concepts, you can, you know, understand it. I still play around and I take pump breaks so that I can play around and learn how to use Lantus and Levamir. Like I, I started on Lantus and I thought it was uh, a very simple, straightforward product. Uh, then I was scared away with Bernstein, and I don't know if he still is. Uh, Lantus kind of he he had concerns about it, um, so that's where his Levamir comes in. And so, the, like I tried with Levamir, and I had a harder time with Levamir than I did with Lantus. And as somebody who's active, Tracebo was not the answer either because it that that takes three days to try to adjust mm -hmm. the temp to to adjust basal. So like they all have pros and cons, like there's a reason why Traceba is advantageous and it provides some safety factors in some settings, like if you miss a dose, um, you know, like, but it depends, you know, like for me, finding a time for a third dose of Levomir was harder, um, you know, but like Glantis, I still needed to split. So there's all the, all these, you know, techniques that you need to kind of understand and until more people are kind of familiar with low carb management. We're just left to figure it out ourselves and chat in Facebook groups. And, you know, like at least we have a forum here where we can kind of at least bring awareness to these issues and talk about it. And, you know, like there's a lot of wisdom within the, the low carb, you know, diabetes community. And it's just about kind of cataloging it all. And, you know, Bernstein has the best resource reference guidebook that there is out there. The more I read it, each time that I've read that book, I've learned something from it. And, you know, he's old school, but like the physiology hasn't changed since he wrote it the first time. And like some of the tools have updated and some of the foods and some of his recommendations have slightly changed. But like, like diabetes is the same, you know, like you can just, you know, you need to get to know this, this disease and how your body reacts to things like exercise or lost sleep or infection and all these things that you know, luckily, if you don't, you could just go on Facebook at two in the morning and say, help. True. People are there. And, and then how do you take your R insulin? I, I use syringes for R. 
I, I use syringes quite a bit, actually. I, I, I um, like doing a lot of a lot of my corrections just for it kind of just bypasses the logic. Like if I'm having to correct at night, I'll usually just grab a syringe instead anyway, because I just keep it by the bedside. And then if it was a concern of like a pod site or something like that, I'm bypassing that. But that's just personal preference of what I'm comfortable with. Um, so but I kind of hybrid it. So what insulin are you using for corrections? You I'll, I'll, so you a lot of my corrections, I'll do intramuscular. So I'll, I'll use Novolog through uh, intramuscular, usually deltoid. Because um, mm -hmm. I like, um, like if, I, if I'm correcting at night, I'm usually running at like five in the morning. So I don't want that tail. So not only does an intramuscular onset faster, but it clears out faster. So I have, I have better luck kind of waking up and being on target and being able to um, dose my dawn phenomenon more accurately and safely get out the door for my 40 minute run. So have you tried any of the faster insulins, like faster than Novolog, like Fiasp and that sort of? Um, I did play around with a Pedra at one point and it was the strangest thing, you know, they, they, they talk about, um, I'm a morning person. So like, this is when I was working for that doctor where I had an hour drive to get to his clinic and three mornings in a row where I used it for my dawn phenomenon, I got drowsy and had to pull over for a coffee halfway. And I believe that was an allergic reaction to a Pedra. Oh. So I've stayed away from that one. And I just don't see a personal need for any of the other ones because just comfort with what I have working. And, you know, like a, an I am to me is, is fine. Uh, you know, like the inhaled insulin sounds interesting to me. I'm not sure about wanting insulin exposure in my lungs or not, but like, you know, I like that these tools are, are around. Um, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't had any experience with Fiasp. <laughs> yeah, I haven't either. So I was just uh, wondering if you had, okay, let's talk about the A1C Corey. Um, should, should our focus be on the A1Cs? Should we judge someone's control? Given the technology that we have now and all the graphs and your patterns and your trends. So given all that information, most of our endos or diabetologists here in the UK are still focusing on A1C. That's all, your A1C. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, I did a presentation a, a while ago for a group, uh, uh, Weston A. Price group, where I kind of broke down and I was looking at the data um, because I was interested in like the variability. One of the things, other eye-opening things is the variability in just blood sugar testing accuracy because my first AccuCheck meter read falsely 20, 20 points high. So when I was targeting, I was coming from an A1C of 11 and I was targeting 100, but really hitting 80, which I felt quite low at that point. And I was just went in and did a lab test and confirmed that. So knowing that there's a 20% allowance and variation in, in glucometers in their own right, mm -hmm. uh, and that's still allowed in the normal range, maybe it's 15%, but you know, like the higher, the more variability they allow. So there's variability in that number. And then when you look at the studies of how they calculate A1C, there's been argument about, you know, which formula is right. And Bernstein has his own formula. Um, and, you know, like, there, but there's just some sloppiness there. But, you know, like, I remember zooming in on like blood sugar versus A1C, and there's a lot of variability within the same A1C of what actual average blood sugar could be. And I know that there's conditions with like beta thalassemia, I, I'm, I'm butchering the name of that condition, but like conditions where like red blood cell turnover is faster. Yes. Or, you know, like that would be anemia type conditions where those things would throw it off. Um, but that said, it's it's a good tool. It's a great tool. Um, I like doing home A1C tests when I can, because I like not going to the doctor for them because <laughs> their fear is right. I'm not going to pay for that. It's like $150 for me to run an A1C at uh, the lab with, with my insurance, whereas I can buy 20 tests for $200 off of Amazon. And they're within 0.3 of what I would predict from my meter values after I've confirmed my meters accuracy to a lab draw, you know, to make sure that my meter now is accurate. 
but you know, like they are, they are just numbers. Ideally, what you're looking for isn't just the low A1C at a certain target, though. Um, you want stability. You know, like you can hide high variability with uh, extreme lows. You know, because glycation takes. I think Bernstein says somewhere like it has to be like a extended glycation, like 24 hours of a high before it's irreversible. And there's some chemistry behind that. Um, so like you want to, you want to keep that standard deviation on blood sugar intact. Um, I use a Libre as my CGM. I use the oldest one that doesn't have alarms because that was good enough, but now I'll be switching to the G6. Um, because now with all the kids, it's just not good enough. I would appreciate an alarm now. Um, but I notice all kinds of effects just from body temperature shifts, like when I'm exercising, showering, or sauna, or exposed to the sun, or cold. Because um, it's about, you know, like interstitial blood flow and, you know, perfusion and hydration status. And there's noise in all these numbers. So, like, really just what you want is stability and, you know, confirm... I think people should still be confirming, you know, whenever I'm dosing insulin, you know, before a meal, I, I, I fight myself because even off of Libre, it's tempting to just get in the habit of being like, oh, Libre says I'm good. And if it's a stable trend and I know there's no reason for it to be inaccurate, then I might trust it. But if it's a dynamic, like, oh, I had just eaten a couple hours before and I know I still have active insulin and it, I had just worked out, I might want to check. I'll do a, a finger stick just to always make sure before I dose insulin because that's the the most accurate number. And you know, like the Dexcoms can even hide a little bit of variability, and you can keep a Dexcom flatter than your blood sugar. Like I used to test 14 times a day when I was uh endurance running, and because like it changes fast and interstitial fluid legs back then it was 10 to 15 minutes behind maybe now it's tightening up a little bit but i don't know that might just be the advertising um but you know you can you it's all my, my analogy because i'm a cyclist is like the difference between the like if you ride your bike through a puddle and you watch how your front wheel tracks versus your rear rear wheel tracking you're going to see the rear wheel tracking on a straighter path than the front wheel, which is doing these little micro course <laughs> corrections. And that front wheel is kind of like the blood sugar finger stick value. And that trailing value, which is a little smoothed out, is your CGM value. And probably the trail behind that, you know, back if you're trailing a, I don't know, a string of cans or something would be what a, what an A1C would kind of show you as far as your your accuracy. So it's like these smoothing functions. Like my Libre has a smoothing function where when I look at values, I'll see it change the history. And like, who is that benefiting? <laughs> like, what's the point of that? You know, like, I guess it makes me supposed to sleep better at night. But, and I know that many times it's wrong, but what is it, benef who is it benefiting by smoothing that out afterwards? Like, I'm using a CGM for decisions on the spot. So when I... Like specifically, if I hop out of the sauna and I scan right while my body is hot, it'll show me like 60 or 80 points hotter or higher. Mm -hmm. And then like if I get out and nothing, you know, and it's just like trying to figure out like in its algorithm what what happened there. And something about where your phone is also matters. It must be a temperature sensor connection between my phone. I don't know. This is this is a, a riddle to me still. Well, that's but, interesting because it's it's the same with the Dexcom as well, just yeah. after a shower. Yeah. So I suddenly hit like high from a normal yeah. high after a, a five minute shower. Yeah. And then I allow myself good like five minutes. At first I used to panic and then, oh my yeah. goodness, what's happening? I need to just press the corrections. Yeah, <laughs> and then that's I'm just dangerous. Low. Now I ignore it. And then five, yeah. 10 minutes later, I'm back to normal again. So yeah. it must be the temperature. Yeah. To give you a solution to that is a cold shower or at least finishing your shower cold because that'll change it. And it, uh, cold showers have some positive effects on dopamine. They do. They yeah. do. They do. Um, so I should really try that. Um, okay, Corey, uh, this was um, a wonderful conversation. We spent over an hour discussing. Sorry if I ramble on some things. Is there anything else that you think was important that we didn't mention? 
I mean, there's so many important things in this disease that we could talk about. So I'm sure like, I'm glad we covered LADA and misdiagnosis. Um, honestly, I think like lifestyle change is hard. And I think just the the way the, the this needs to be embraced as like a supported choice. Uh, that's like, you know, and, and you're raising awareness towards that. Um, so I appreciate that. And thank you very much for, for having me and being a part of that. Um, but yeah, there's, there's so many topics. Like I've had this condition for 11 years now and I'm not bored of it. You know, like I kind of see myself as a, as a science experiment. And luckily I was a bit of a scientist to, um, kind of see the positive and embrace it because it's just this huge insight into metabolism. And, you know, I, I like to kind of challenge myself and learn, learn to do this stuff for myself. But then it's like, I should have been taught this by somebody, you know, like I would have loved and, and Bernstein, it, you know, to an extent is that, but even in 450 pages, I feel like there's another 450 pages unwritten out there that only some people may want to read, but there's, there's just so much to know about how to understand, you know, this condition and the alternative ways of doing it. I like that you brought up Dr. Runyon. He was very helpful at my first, um, because when I was diagnosed, I had signed up for another Ironman that next year. And I found his, his blog right away because he had done one in 2012 with type one on a keto diet. And he answered email questions for me for free. And I love that he did that. And I'm forever grateful uh, to Dr. Runyon for that. Um, and now seeing that he's more into the strength and kind of Olympic lifting. And I think he's mm -hmm. still doing that. He's, and still, talking doing about that. he's still putting out his data regularly just you yeah. can see every yeah. three months and they're such detailed not just his a1c but everything that comes along with diabetes so um so i think it's it's wonderful to actually see that level of detail from yeah. another type one <laughs> yeah i mean i i include i mean yeah like i i, I have so much focus on blood sugar in my own right that like I'm still a bit of an athlete, but like, I don't train anything about detail anymore. Cause my detail is all my, my, my bandwidth is, is, you know, where I'm comfortable with it as far as like, I'll focus on what I want to focus on. And like, I run for pleasure now, but um, like, he's kind of taken me where it's like, I, you know, I run for my mental health or, you know, to be able to manage the day, you know, comfortable helps me with anxiety and, and hectic mornings with kids. Um, but I think like strength training is a really important feature. Bernstein talks about a bit in his book. Uh, and I love that Bern that uh, Runyon has a, a strong focus on that as well. And I think that, that that's an important health topic because like you can have excellent blood sugar sitting on a couch doing nothing, but that's not the the goal. And that's not how we live long, uh, healthy, you know, optimal lives. We, we got to have strength and I, I really underestimated that initially and now like I'm kind of getting into that and that's that's kind of a fun part of my life right now is kind of you know like um playing around with the you know the convergent logic with keto gains like they're they're a very informative group and so I I you know point people towards that as far as exercise and embracing some of those things especially women I couldn't agree uh with you more because I feel my best when I'm doing strength training. The unfortunate thing about my life is that we're frequent travelers. So, <laughs> and traveling brings chaos. And, you know, whenever I'm in a new, I'm currently recording this from California, right? So it took me two weeks, even three, to actually come up with a new basal um, <laughs> uh, setting, such so setting for me to suit this climate, this way of life. Uh, this weather, this sort of diet, although my diet hasn't changed, but somehow I feel like even dairy, for example, um, and certain other vegetables seem to have a different impact on my blood sugars. Um, I'd like to believe I'm not imagining, but uh, but that's something you know I'm working on. What is it? Do they actually mix in, say, I don't know, um, a sugar but they don't claim it in the uh, nutrition labels because i can eat the same mozzarella cheese in england and i know yeah. exactly what impact it will have have on my blood sugars whereas here every single time it feels like i've had um candy 
Uh, so yeah. there must be something about dairy itself. Or well, if it's pre-shredded stuff, sweats. that always has anti-caking starches on it. Like, there's... It's not in the it's ingredients. Like mozzarella, yeah, maybe it's younger. I don't know. Like, there's... It, I check Probably ingredients sugar list. Sugar hidden everywhere in our food here. Diligently. Like, if there's something yeah. in the ingredients list I don't understand, I don't yeah. get it. However, so, uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, uh, it, it, when you said that you're a science experiment, I look at myself as a science experiment. And just as you feel, you know, you've cracked it and you've, you know, and then you go through hormonal changes and then you have to yeah. review your basal settings and then something changes in your life or lifestyle. Um, you have to constantly work on your diabetes you can't just pretend it's not there and you know ignore it you can't do it it's important because there are serious consequences yeah you might for me I, I kind of figure you might as well embrace it um like I understand not everybody would want to you know dedicate as much energy as I do I can very much put it on the back burner like you know as far as my daily life but like just knowing that so much needs to change in the world about, I feel like we're in the dark ages as far as blood sugar management and both all three, five, seven, whatever, how many flavors of diabetes there really are out there. Um, and yeah, like you talk about misunderstood issues like hormone issues, female health issues, like those are still super deep in the dark ages. And like, that's the topic of tonight's chapter. And even, Bernstein only tacks that one on, into the back of his book about, you know, uh, issues like P PCOS and and things like that. And like um, Allison's the other coach at Diverge, and she was one of my first online friends who was like, everything she says makes sense to me. Um, and, and like we connected real early and she's written a fantastic pregnancy book. That's such an important topic. Um, like I'm kind of like all into this whole fatherhood thing and, you know, like the nutrition aspect of what I had to figure out for my own health, like it, diabetes can suck. I mean, I hate saying that because it, 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 you know, like it's all, it's all a framework, but really it's been a gift as far as what it's taught me, um, the impact that it's had on the health of my children who all eat uh, similarly protein focused and they're thriving on their growth curves and sleep fantastically and are rarely ever sick and all these things as far as optimal health, like, what you have to do to control diabetes is what you have to do to be optimally healthy in this world. So, you know, like embracing those things has a very wonderful silver lining. So like, I'm excited to bring this way of eating to everybody who needs it because it's not just type ones, it's 92% of the, the American adults are metabolic, metabolically ill right now. And, you know, like that's everyone, you know, like, and they will all benefit from a low carbohydrate approach. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Okay, well, Corey, I'm gonna let you go back to your kiddos. They'll yeah. be up soon from their nap. Um, so thank you so much for um, for accepting to come on and share your wisdom. It's a pleasure. <laughs> I'll, These are my ramblings. I'll speak to you soon, Corey. Take thank care. Bye-bye.